Hello and welcome to The Sim Hanger. My name's Mark. The Sim Hanger for all things flight sim related. In this video we're going to look at 9 aspects of Microsoft Flight Simulator that may enhance your simming experience. But first, details on our giveaway. FSoutlet.com has kindly donated a 20 US dollar gift card, which we'll be giving away to one lucky subscriber. The gift card will have a voucher code which will allow you to spend up to US $20 with this online retailer. To be in with the chance of winning, all you need to do is email me at simhangerflightsimulation at gmail.com. The subject or title of your email should be fsoutlet.com as shown on screen and I need to have received it by the 4th of March. That's all you need to do. All emails received with the correct subject heading will be entered in the draw and one lucky name picked out. You can also access my email address by going to my YouTube channel, link in the notes below. And under About, click on Display Email Address and my email will be shown. Email addresses will not be shared with any third party including fsoutlet.com. But now it's time to get started. Would you like to have your name or personal registration number on your aircraft? And it'll display on the outside of the aircraft and in the cockpit too. It's easy, let me show you how. From the main startup menu, click on World Map and then from the top left hand corner, click on your aircraft and at the bottom there you'll see ATC options. Choose that. Choose tail number and enter your selection there. Up to a maximum of 9 digits or letters will be displayed on the aircraft. Let's put in your name as example. That's done, let's click OK and let's go back to the flight. And there you have it, your name or registration will show on the outside of your aircraft and in the cockpit as well. We're in the cockpit and let's open the top toolbar. I'm going to choose camera for this demonstration. To undock this window, click on the box icon. On the top right hand side, the one between the close and minimize functions. Our camera menu is now undocked. We can freely change its size and shape. But most importantly, we can drag it now to another monitor if we want to. So we could keep this menu open whilst we fly. Obviously for practical purposes, you do need a second monitor. Let's try it with another menu option. And this time I'm going to choose the weather. And I'm going to click the undocking icon. And the same thing happens. This can now be dragged to a separate monitor. Closing an undocked display will bring it back into the sim. But this undocking is not limited just to menus. Whilst holding the right alt key, move your mouse and hover over one of the displays and click it. And it will undock that window. And as per the menus, it's movable and you can change size and shape and so on. We can do the same with the other glass cockpit display. You can have both cockpit displays open separately or you can combine them. Holding down the right alt key, first click one display and then click the other. And now you have a dual display, which can be shown on a separate monitor. Once again, close the undocked window display and you're back to normal. Are you tweaking your system and settings to get the best performance? Are you using the frame counter via the developer mode as indicated? If you're looking for something smaller and less intrusive and something that will also give you an average frame rate, try this. From your desktop, on the taskbar, click on the search icon and enter in Game Mode. An icon will appear Game Mode Settings. Click on that and it will take you to the screen. As previously covered, I always recommend Game Mode be left off. But click on Xbox Game Bar and switch that on. Note to open the Xbox Game Bar. It's the Windows key and G. Let's head back to our sim. With the Windows Game Bar now enabled, we can hit the Windows key and the G key to bring up the Windows Bar. And the only one we're interested in here is the fifth icon along, Performance. Click on that and another window opens. And it displays various information for GPU, CPU, RAM and frames per second. I know the GPU is sitting at 100% all the time, so I'm not sure it's measuring the right parameter here. We can ensure this window stays on top by hitting the pin key in the top right hand corner. By clicking through the various individual items, we can see a respective graph. 
and under frames per second we can see it's indicating an average, currently 35 frames per second. By clicking on this icon we can bring up a configuration menu which will allow us to configure various aspects including what information is displayed. By clicking on the top bar and holding down the left mouse key you can drag this window anywhere you want and because it's pinned it'll stay on top. Click anywhere on the screen and it only leaves that information. I have checked the FPS counter against the inbuilt developer mode one and it seems fairly accurate. By clicking the arrow in the bottom right hand corner we can hide the graph and make the display information even smaller. We can redisplay the graph information again by clicking on the arrow at the bottom. And to close down the application and remove the information from on screen, we bring up the game bar again by hitting Windows and G key. Unpin the window and close it, and then click anywhere on screen, and it's gone. Keeping your software up to date at all times is always a challenge. And that is why when possible I have a preference to purchase my software via the marketplace as opposed to direct from a retailer. And that's because Microsoft Flight Simulator has a content manager under profiles. So I click on my profile setting and then onto my content manager. The content manager shows me I've got 217 programs installed, which includes all the Asobo Microsoft products, but also indicates if any updates are available. There are none at present for my system. But this update information only relates to the core Asobo Microsoft products, as well as any products downloaded and subsequently updated within the marketplace. For example, I purchased the MB339 from India Fox Echo via the marketplace. If I click on it, I'll get any update information. I'll also be advised of updates if they update the product in the marketplace. But this does not apply to products in the community folder, but they are shown here. You'll notice on the right hand side, instead of up to date, it has simply a reference of community. As Microsoft has no reference to third party products downloaded from external sites and whether or not they're up to date. So the content manager can't manage these files. There are a few exceptions, of course, such as Orbix and Orbix Central, which updates you automatically anyway. And of course, not all programs are available from the marketplace. But where possible, that's my preference and I periodically check here for any updates. From the main menu, let's go back to Profile and this time onto Logbook. And here, as you're probably aware, it logs all your various flights. But it may have a feature that you're not aware of. If you select a particular flight and click on it, you get a Fly Again option. Click on Yes and it will load that flight. The only caveat seems it is from departure to destination directly and doesn't retain flight plan information. But it's a quick and easy way to repeat a flight. Hopefully this feature will be improved in future updates. A number of subscribers have asked whether or not the files within the community folder affect load times. And the simple answer is yes. Load times are impacted by what's in the community folder, to varying degrees. Scenery depends on what area you're flying in, and items such as liveries and aircraft are on initial load. I can demonstrate this. Within my community folder, I have quite a lot of liveries. So I did a load test with and without the liveries within the community folder. And here you can see the difference in the load times for Microsoft Flight Simulator just to start up. The liveries I had were Megapack version 8. Now there'll always be a need to have various programs installed in the community folder. And there are a number of third party applications that will help you manage this but it'll pay you from time to time to remove anything not being used, as this could have a significant impact on how quickly you can get into the sky. A quick flight setup is easy to do in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Let's say, for example, you just want to practice a landing. Select your chosen airport and zoom in to the details. Select a point, 
a short distance away from the runway by clicking on the map and then set that point as your departure. You could now just go and fly, or in this case we're doing a landing, so we'll select the airport as our arrival point to ensure the aircraft is aligned and pointing in the right direction. Microsoft Flight Simulator tends to put you far too high, between 7.5 and 8.500 feet, regardless of distance from the airport. So click on Navlog and change your altitude in the cruise box. In this example, I've changed it to 1500 feet and it's showing me I'm four nautical miles away from the runway. That sounds perfect. I'm done. Click on Navlog to take me back and let's go fly. You can access your rolling cache information via Options, then General, and then click on Data. Just a quick aside note on photogrammetry, make sure that's switched on after updates. Updates have a tendency to switch it off. If we page down, we can see the rolling cache, whether it's on or off, and the size of the rolling cache. And a question raised to me by more than one subscriber is, what size should that cache be? Well, what I can tell you is there is not consensus across the board in terms of optimal size. Default is 8 GB, but you can delete that and make it any size you want. Caution, however, this is a lengthy process. By way of explanation, the rolling cache is an area that you're allocating on one of your hard drives for Microsoft Flight Simulator to preload information. And I've experimented from default 8 GB up to 50 GB, and I must say I've seen very little difference, if any difference at all. But I have a relatively fast internet connection, and this may be a factor. I know some users with super fast broadband, well, they don't have it on at all. They have their rolling cache switched off. The reason I have mine at 32 GB is Sebastian, the CEO of Asobo, mentioned that was the size of cache he was using, and I guess he would know. So unfortunately, I can't give you a definitive answer on this one. If you know different, please let me know in the comments below. And also just to touch on the manual cache quickly. Once again, you have to predetermine the size of the cache. I'm not using one because of my internet speed, but it can be very useful if you have got slow broadband or you tend to fly just in one or two areas. It also provides you with a level of detail option between low, medium and high. The world map that you see to start your flights can be tailor-made to suit you. In addition to having a legend so you can identify what the icons mean, it also has fairly extensive filters and you can use these to change your map display, be it satellite or IFR for long range flight planning or a blend of both. You can determine whether or not you want to see rain and cloud information within the world map. And you can also get a graphical representation of ground, low and high winds. Again, this could be useful for your flight planning purposes, particularly for long haul. You can make the world map as detailed or as uncluttered as you want by simply turning on and off the various filters, as well as points of interest, such as fauna. If you exit the filter and type fauna into the search bar, it'll bring up a list of locations where all the various animals that are animated within Microsoft Flight Simulator can be found from bears to seagulls, flamingos, elephants, as well as geese. Let's take a quick look at one example. I'm going to choose, I think, giraffes. I'm going to click on Douan in Africa. I'm zoomed into the map. Set as departure. Point of interest is on so I can find them. Let's fly. You can, of course, use active pause and then use your drone camera and go and have a look at the animals. In this case, I'm going to land close to them and then use the drone camera. There are limited animals in Microsoft Flight Simulator, but the animations are very good indeed. Well, I trust you found some of that useful and informative. 
Don't forget to enter our giveaway. A gift card worth 20 US dollars from Flight Sim Outlet. Entry details as per at the beginning of this video. Somebody's got to win it right, so enter. It might as well be you. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope to see you soon. Take care, look after yourselves and bye for now.